I'm going to encourage you to help Global Teen Challenge. This does not go to our local Teen Challenge. It just, by chance, the Holy Spirit brought them here this morning. But we want to take up an offering to help with these 32 challenges. 32 nations around the world have asked that we would send a Teen Challenge Center like what we have. It takes $36,000 to establish one and get it off the ground. The other night in our missions service, when Teen Challenge sang and, and they had the other special stuff going on, they showed this video. They took an a offering up that night and pledges up that night for Teen Challenge. And the goal is to start 32. I don't know if you can do the math, but 32 times 36,000. We're over a million dollars looking at that. I'm here to tell you this morning that we have not made our pledge. We've not done anything as a church. I'm asking you today to do your best. I was, it was reported on Monday night, I mean, excuse me, Wednesday night, the following night, that the pledges and offerings that came in was $991,000 on that one offering. Can I hear an amen? Awesome response. How many of you know there's a big challenge still left? Over, you know, uh, you know probably 100 or another 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars at least needs to come in to, to even get it up there or to see more. I haven't done the math, but we need to see it happen. Church, I know that we can't do it all, but I know that whatever we give will be given to that ministry to reach the lives of people around the world that need help. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come. We're going to take that offering this morning. Let me say we're going to receive it. We're not going to take it. Uh, if we take it, um, then we would have guns and we would say, give me all your money. <laughs> we don't want to do that. We're going to receive the offering and you do what God puts on your heart. You do what you can. If you don't have it this morning, you can certainly uh, turn it in at another time, and we'll see that it's funneled that way. But I challenge you, do your very best. Let's reach the lost around the world. Amen? It's the heartbeat of God. Lord, thank you. Thank you today for Teen Challenge. Lord, I thank you for our local Teen Challenges and what you're doing in them. But, Lord, there are countries around the world that are seeing what's going on here at home. And God, they're desiring to see that same thing for the people in their nations. God, I pray that you would help us to send forth laborers into the field. And God, I pray that you would bless our people as they give to this mission today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. While they're receiving your offerings, let me encourage you to turn your Bibles today to Acts chapter 1. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. I want to share with you a message I really believe is for today. Um, you know, I, I see and hear a lot of things. How many of you know our world is not where we at all want it to be? One, two, three, four, okay. How many of you realize this morning that our world is not where we would really like to see it? Amen? Amen. There's a lot of stuff going on that we're not really happy with. I want to share with you a couple of thoughts this morning. You know, some people are opposed to the beliefs of the church of Jesus Christ. I was doing a little research this week, and, and uh, there's a new name that I found. I guess it's been out there for a while, but it's called Gnomes. Anybody ever heard of Gnomes? Okay, a couple of you. Gnomes, and, and this research, you can, you can Google it up, but these are people that do not identify with any particular religion. Either they have no religion, or they don't want a religion, or they're not identified with any type of religion. That group of people is growing and growing and growing every single day. People are falling by the wayside out of the house of the Lord. They're falling into the trap of the world. How many of you know the world is out there to swallow us up? It's out there to take us. The enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, the Bible tells us. Amen? Well... Jim Simbola said this several years ago. He said, the church, instead of engaging this world and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's love with accompanied signs and wonders and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, instead of that, has reacted in one of three ways. Listen to this. This is what Jim says. 
He says the church is running away from the world. Number one, they're running away from the world. They're circling their wagons and saying, isn't it horrible the way people are living out there today? A lot of people do that. Oh, isn't it bad? Isn't it bad the way things are going? These folks have forgotten that we are the salt and the light of the world. How many of you know God has us here for a reason? God has us here for a purpose. The second thing that Jim says about these, uh, the church people and the way they're reacting to what's going on, it says the church is running around making harsh, condemning statements about the world and its people. They're forgetting that they are not the enemy. These folks are not the enemy, but rather these folks are our mission field. They're the ones that we're out to win. Can I hear an amen? That's the loss. That's the one we're supposed to be working on. And the third one that he says was the church is letting the world evangelize us without even realizing it. The church has allowed the world to evangelize it. How many of you have heard of Barna Research? George Barna does research on church uh, polls and such, and several years ago there was a poll taken, and they did this on, on this particular poll. It was, it was amazing, the shocking results. He said he reported that regular churchgoers are very similar to the general population in the world in many ways. First of all, those who bought a lottery ticket in the past week, non-Christians were 27%. Christians were... <clears throat> 23%. Those who watch PG-13 or R-rated movies, non-Christians were 87%, and Christians were 76%. And the third one that he shows on this research is, those who have been divorced, non-Christians 23%, and Christians 27%. Amazing. Not much difference in the way the world looks versus the church. The church has taken on the image of the world. We're looking too much like them. According to the statistics, there's not a whole lot of difference between us and today's society. The New Testament church and the world should be completely opposite. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying this morning? The New Testament church and the world shouldn't look a lot alike. We're supposed, we're supposed to be a peculiar people. Come on, are you with me? God wants us to make a difference. According to these statistics, we need to make some changes in our life. Instead of being the church, being instead of the church being holy and powerful people available to be used by God, we have allowed the world's value system to infiltrate the church. We look too much like the world. We act too much like the world. Some people can't tell the difference between us and the world. Let's look at our scripture this morning, Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, this should be very familiar for most of you if you're Pentecostal. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote to you all about Jesus and began what he began to teach and do until the day that he was taken up into heaven. And after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, which he had chosen, he says, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Look at verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father's promise, which he promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when, we, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, I pray that you would anoint me to share your word. 
Lord, that the word that you have placed in my heart and the thoughts for today, God, would come alive into our spirit. God, that you would just pierce us in such a way that, God, we would conform into what you want us to be. Lord, no longer what we want, but, God, what you want. I pray that you will help us to be the true men and women of God that you want us to be in these last days. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Today's society... We can't continue to do things in our own natural ability. I don't care if you're a Sunday school teacher, whether you're a missionette worker, a Royal Ranger worker, you're in the choir, on the worship team, whether you're a greeter at the door, let me say, if you're doing it in your own ability, it's not enough. Let me say it again, it's not enough. We need the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives, amen? We wonder why people are falling away. We wonder why things are going like they are. But there's something missing in the church this morning, and it's more of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the demonstration of the Holy Ghost in our lives today, and we need to be saints of God. You see, some of us have just fallen away, and we've allowed the world to incorporate us into it instead of us incorporating the Holy Spirit into our life. What are we digesting? What are we spending our time on? What are we doing now? Are we not spending enough time in prayer? Are we not spending enough time in the, with the Holy Spirit? Folks, we need the Holy Spirit. We keep blaming the world for its problems. We keep blaming the people who are falling away. But let me tell you, it's our fault. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? We need more of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We need God. We need that power. What the church is missing, number one, is the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew that his disciples would soon be facing spiritual powers and strongholds of darkness. How many of you understand? Every single day we're facing something that's going to attack us. There are spiritual attacks against us, and we need to be ready to fight those attacks. We need to be ready to stand strong and be firm when the, when the world comes against us. We need to be prepared with God's word so that we can make a stand. In Ephesians, it tells us that we're to put on the full armor of God. Amen? And once you put it on, he says, then stand firm. How many of you know sometimes we just get pushed around? We let the devil push us where he wants to. We allow him to have his way in our family, in our life. But church, I'm here to tell you, we need to get back on our knees in prayer. We need to find ourselves depending on the Holy Spirit to help us. And when we do, then things will begin to change. We're playing around. We've played church too long. It's time to get serious with God. You see, Jesus knew that his disciples would need wisdom and discernment. He knew that they would need boldness. He knew that they needed more power than what they had in their own ability. We can't depend on what I can do or what you can do. We need help from on high this morning, amen? You see, preaching alone doesn't cause conversions or result in more baptisms. And it doesn't, you know, it's not going to expand the kingdom of God in just preaching. When Peter, on the day of Pentecost, came outside and he began to minister to the crowds and the multitude that came, he couldn't do it on his own. Up to that point, he had never preached a message. Matter of fact, the, late, the last greatest thing he did was to deny Jesus Christ. Come on. Up to that point, he was doing nothing. But when he waited in that upper room, come on. When he stayed there for those few days and he began to tarry on God and say, God, I need that promise. God, I need that help. God, I need your anointing. God, I don't know how we're going to make it without Jesus. And Jesus said, come on, I sent you another comforter. He's coming. Just hold on. Terry there. Wait. Just wait. It's coming. And as soon as it comes, the power of God fell. It was like a fire, cloven tongues over their heads, the Bible tells us. And they all began to speak in an unknown language. Are you hearing me this morning? They didn't know what they were doing. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. And the people crowded around the outside of that building, and as they did, they began to question, what is the meaning of this? What's going on? And Peter, not under his own ability, but under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, began to preach the word with boldness and declare the truths of God. And people were saved. Over 3,000 on that one day gave their heart to Christ. 
Church, I'm here to tell you, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life this morning. We need his anointing. We need his power. We can't make it our own. You see, Jesus didn't send his 12 out right away. When he ascended into the heavens, he said, don't even try to pass go. Don't even get out there. Don't even mess around with it. Last night when we were at Joseph's, it was kind of uh, neat. I was watching this older couple came in. And we were sitting at the table, and this older couple, they had pre-ordered their meal, I could tell, because they came in, and they told them they were here, and the lady said, I'll get it right out, and there it was. And so they were sitting at the table, and next thing I know, he gets up from his table, and I watch him pull out of his pocket a bunch of tracks. And so he starts slipping around the tables. So he was passing out tracks, telling them about Jesus. Church, where have, we've lost it. Have you hear, you hear me? Where's our boldness? I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to interfere with their death. I don't want to do this. Church, are you happy with Jesus? Are you excited about it? I mean, when something good happens, don't you tell somebody? When something happens in your life, aren't you excited enough that you want to share what God has done or what somebody has done in your life? Or have you lost the thrill? Maybe I need to get that guy to sing that song one more time. The thrill is gone. Huh? How many of you know? The thrill shouldn't leave us. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to continue on that journey that he's called us to do. So get filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the presence of God fill your life. He says, wait there in the city. You see, we've been too guilty of trying to do things on our own. We try to do it in our own ability. You know, Allison, I praise God for you and your ability to play this keyboard. I can come over here and I can play around and I can play a chord or two or something, but I can't do it on my own. I know that Allison, when she first started, she had some skills and abilities. But when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on, God begins to make fingers do that we don't know how to do. Am I telling the truth? Some people wonder, well, how did you do this? How did you do that? You say, I don't know. It was just God. God did it. Some of you that are Sunday school teachers, you say, I've never taught in my life. I don't even know what I'm doing. I did bad in school. I wasn't very good. But somehow when the Holy Spirit gets involved, he begins to make a formula. It begins to make us winners. Can I hear an amen? He causes us to be successful in the things that we do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can I hear an amen? Well, we've all been too guilty at times of doing the work ourselves instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to help us. That doesn't mean stop doing things. It just means we need to be more dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. When I come in here to preach, I know that, God, I can't do it on my own. God, I need your anointing. God, I am dependent upon you. I can't make it on my own. I need your help. We need the same power that the disciples experienced at Pentecost working in our lives today. The second thing that I would share with you is how can the Holy Spirit help us? Zechariah tells us this. He says the Spirit can move mountains. How many of you know the Holy Spirit can move mountains? Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. I want you to know mountains can collapse in the power, in the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you're facing this morning, some of you that were here, maybe you didn't even come down. I'm here to tell you that God can cause that mountain that you're looking at to crumble and fall this morning. Can I hear it? Amen. Paul in Philippians 4.13 tells the church of Philippi, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Church, I can't do it on my own, but with God's help, I can do it. With God's anointing, I can do it. How many of you know the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you richly? Can I hear an amen? Romans 8.26 says this, 
The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Paul knew that he was dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, Paul told the church at Corinth, he says this, my grace is sufficient for you. This is what the Lord told him. He says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. How many of you know we got some weaknesses in our life? Anybody else here got weakness in your life? I can't make it without him. I can't do it without him. I'm lost without him. There's no way I can continue to do what I do without his help. I need his anointing in my life. I need his help in my life. Paul continues to say, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Church, quit saying what you've done. Start going around, with God's help, I was able to do this. With God's anointing, I was able to accomplish this. With the anointing of God, he allowed me to be a part of what he was doing. How many of you know we need to give glory to God? Come on, it's him who does it. Come on, give him some praise this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Paul continues that statement in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. He says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that my Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. How many of you know when you're going through some rough times, God's fixing to do something good? You look at it as something bad, but I'm here to tell you, get ready, get ready, get ready. God's fixing to do something great in your life. He's fixing to turn something around if you'll just hold on and trust him. He's going to make a change. That's what Paul saw. When you think about Paul's life, when he was left in prison, when he was beaten, when he was stoned to death and raised back to life, it was tough times. But he said God was still in it. And when God's in it, come on, there's no limit to what God can do. There's no limit to what God can do in your life. There's no limit today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Come on, I want you to know this morning, we become strong through Jesus Christ. One more time, Paul says this in Romans 15. In Romans 15, Paul tells the church at Rome that what he accomplished was through the power of the Spirit. He says, therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I've said and done, by the power of signs and miracles and through the power of the Spirit. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit is what makes the difference in the life of the believer. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives today. If you think you can make it on your own, it ain't going to happen. You will fall by the wayside. There will be difficulties that will come into your life that you cannot handle. That's why Jesus promised. He said, look, I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going to send somebody that's going to be right there for you. He said, he won't leave you. He'll be there till the end. Hold on to him. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The third thing that I would share with you this morning is this. Does God still give power to his believers like he did on the day of Pentecost? Some people think that maybe it's past. The Holy Spirit's not for today. Church, if the Holy Spirit's not for today, I'm not going to make it. If the Holy Spirit's not for us today, then we're in trouble. I need his help. I am dependent upon him. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is for all of us. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, we read, it says, In the last days, God said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. This is a quote from Joel chapter 2. He says, in the last days, church, I don't know about you, but I think we're in the last days. I think we're facing some signs of times. Come on, are you hearing me? If you read the scriptures, you'll declare with me along that, that we are getting down to the very end. 
And if we need the Holy Spirit ever, we need him now. They needed him when Jesus was here. They believed that was the last days. But church, if that was the last days, then we're in the last moments. We are in the last seconds of what's left of this world as we know it. I believe that before long, the trump of God is going to sound. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. But I pray that somehow, some way, God will change our minds and our hearts and our attitudes and we'll quit looking at people as the problem and we'll start looking at them as the opportunity to touch their lives for the kingdom of God. Can I hear an amen? You see, it's not the enemy, but that's the mission field. We are the salt and we are the light of this world. We are the ones who are going into dark places and bringing in the light of Jesus Christ. We are there to bring hope to the hopeless. Come on. We are there to give them a vision and a hope for tomorrow. Some of them are discouraged, despair. They don't know what to believe in and they're ready to just give up. Life just goes on another day for many of them. But I'm here to tell you, that God has greater things in store. And he wants us to be a part of that. Amen? Amen? Our only hope to make a difference in the world is then to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says again, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Holy Spirit, I need your power. God, send a fresh anointing. My prayer this morning is, God, send down your fire. Send down the power. God, I don't want to blame nothing else on anybody else. God, I want you to anoint me. I want you to anoint me so that I can make a difference with those around me. Wednesday night, our guest speaker at district council was Mark Batterson. Some of you might recognize him. He's written a couple books. In the Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day was the first one he wrote. Great book. If you haven't read it, you need to get it. Another one he did was um, Wild Goose Chase. Thank you very much. I know it was something to do with a duck, but it was a goose. The Wild Goose Chase. Great book. Great book. Third one I remember he did was called The Circle Maker. Let me tell you about The Circle Maker just a little bit. You're going to hear more about this because this is what's going to happen. You're in the balcony, stretch your necks. Look down here. But he says, if you want to see God change things, what you need to do is go find you a place all by yourself and get in there and draw a circle. Get in that circle. Get on your face before God and say, God, I'm not coming out till revival comes to this circle. I want you to understand revival doesn't happen in church with an evangelist. Revival doesn't take place with a big excitement because some preacher or somebody else did something. Revival starts when you get excited personally, individually about serving God and saying, God, change me. Help me to be the man or the woman of God you want me to be. And when we do that, God is going to start a revival that will start from grassroots within. And there's going to be a Holy Spirit move of God. And church, we are going to see this place filled up. Can you hear an Amen. There are going to be people that are lost and undone that are going to come and say, I want what you got. As it is right now, the church has been wanting what the world has. And we need to change our mentality. Come on. How else are we going to change them? They want the Spirit of God. I want to see signs and wonders and demonstrations of the power of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't come when you're chasing after the world doesn't come when we're chasing after things else. When people start drifting away from the congregation, from the church, maybe something's wrong. Maybe we've lost the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Church, I'm telling you, we've got to have a close encounter with God this morning. Are you hearing me? We've got to get serious about our relationship with Jesus Christ and say, God, I want more of you. I don't want to just go to church to hear some preaching. I don't want to go to church just to sing a couple songs. God, I want to have an experience with you like I've never had before. 
the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without wind or chariots without steeds. Like branches without sap, we wither. Like coals without a fire, we are useless. Jim Cimbala said this statement. The idea that the church is just another teaching center or a place to escape from the world is not the right picture. Church, I, don't want to, I know I like to teach. I do a lot of teaching on Wednesday nights. and We need discipleship. We need teaching. We need to learn how to behave. We need to learn how to become children of God. We need to understand the Word. It's important. But church is not just about teaching. We need demonstrations of the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of God flowing. He says, we have a mission from Jesus himself, and the only, only the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will enable us to make a difference. Church, I want to make a difference. How about you? I want to make a difference. I want to see God visit this place. I want to see God visit our people. I want to hear people talking in our community about, man, you ought to hear what's going on at Hill, your first assembly. You ought to see the people that have been flocking to that church, not because of the preacher, not because of the singer, not because of the evangelist, but God has been showing up in that place because people have gotten serious about praying. People have gotten serious about the power of the Holy Spirit, and they are touching the throne of God, and God is making a difference. Church, that's what it's all about. When something exciting happens like that, you can't keep them out of here. We've got to get serious. Do you hear me this morning? It starts with us individually. So I bring this to a close this morning. If you want to make a difference in the world today, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let me say it again. If you want to make a difference in the world today, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. We can't do it on our own abilities. You may be skillful. You may be talented. Some of you have great skills and abilities. But it takes more than that. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. Like these.